Well, hello everybody, and uh, tonight uh, we're going to cover the mean value theorem. Quite the wild rascal. So, uh, but what I want you to do here in your notebook, and you know, my philosophy on sketches is always the bigger the better. But I want you to draw uh, a curve here, and we'll call him f of x. And I'm going to pick two random points on that curve. Let's call this point A, and let's call this point B. And basically what we want to do is we want to ask ourselves, what's the average rate of change of our function between points A and B? So average rate of change is, in other words, the average slope of the function between A and B, is simply represented by the secant line that connects point A to point B, just like that. Okay, and what we're basically saying is that this function, you know, has a lot of positive slopes, it's got some negative slopes, and all in all, it averages out to be the slope of the red line. Now, what I want you to do now is I want you to try to visualize a tangent line that just happens to be parallel to the average rate of change. And I'm imagining maybe a point right around here is a tangent line that happens to be parallel to the red line. And this is a very, very special point right here, this point of tangency right here where the blue line intersects with the um, function f. And that's called point c. And it's very special because at that one instant moment, the instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change. So the slope at point c represents the instantaneous rate of change. And, and that's really what today the mean value theorem is all about, is the fact that the instantaneous rate of change is going to equal the average rate of change at some magical, mysterious point C. And, uh, and when two slopes are the same, we've created parallel lines. So here's a little more official picture than the uh, goofy sketch that I made on the last slide. But we certainly, we, we've got our secant line here that connects point A to point B. And we've got our tangent line here at C. And we just want to clarify that the, the slope of our secant line is the good old-fashioned slope formula from third grade. And then uh, the slope of the tangent line is, again, that's where the calculus comes into play. And all we're going to do is because these two lines have to be parallel, we're going to set these guys equal to each other, and that's what is going to become the mean value theorem. Now, the mean value theorem is quite the wordy rascal, and there are some prerequisites that f of x must abide by in order for the mean value theorem to be applied or legal. So we have to say, let's let f of x be continuous on the closed interval closed interval means square brackets. It means we're going to include the endpoints. And then it has to be differentiable on the open interval from A to B. Okay, So it has to be continuous at the endpoints and everything in between, and then differentiable just in between A and B. Then there must exist at least, okay, at least one magical C value, maybe more than one, possibly, such that A is less than C is less than B. And basically, I want you to point out, or I want you to notice that there are not equal signs on these rascals for a reason. C cannot be an endpoint. C has to be on the interior of our interval. Okay, and here's the kicker. F prime of C is equal to f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. And ladies and gentlemen, what we have here in red, this is the formula for the mean value theorem. And all we're doing is we're saying that the instantaneous rate of change, or the derivative at c, has to equal the average rate of change over an interval from a to b. Again, I just want to really um, develop a, a strong visual blueprint in your mind of the mean value theorem. I think it's really important to be able to visualize it in action rather than just staring at the formula. So we've got our traditional example of our secant line and our tangent line that we've been developing. But also, I, I like this picture down here where it illustrates, okay, we've got an endpoint at zero and another endpoint over here at uh, you know eight or whatever that is. Anyway, so you got your secant line, but then there's one, two, three, four point C's, um, and we, you know, we could classify them with subscripts, you know, let's C sub 1, and C sub 2, and C sub 3, and C sub 4, such that the instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change, and that's why in our definition, we said there's at least one C. Now, there's a lot of verbiage in that definition, and you might think that it's all just worthless jargon, but we're going to find out that those prerequisites are very important. 
So when I first start off doing the mean value theorem, and this is our first example here, uh, don't mind the fact that it says example three right there. Um, I, I'm, I'm big on the graph and being able to visualize what's taking place so we don't just get bogged down into some meaningless formula where we really don't know what the heck's going on. So we've got uh, the interval is defined as from one to five. So I've got, uh, here's point A, so to speak, and the five is right here. There's my point B. And I want to imagine a secant line that connects those two points. So there's your average rate of change over the interval. And then I'm just trying to visualize um, some magical tangent line here in this, you know, certainly isn't going to be the midpoint necessarily, but it'll be somewhere in between A and B such that the instantaneous rate of change is equal, thus creating parallel lines. So here's what the formula says. We need to, first of all, we need to find the derivative. And, um, you know, if I imagine that f of x is really 3 minus 5x to the negative 1, then the derivative is going to be positive 5x to the negative 2. And I need to evaluate the derivative at point C, the formula says. So I've got, uh, I'm going to say that, um, let me just recall that formula just so we all have got that right under our nose here. f of b minus f of a all over b minus a. All right, so f prime of c is going to be 5 over c squared, just substituting the c in for the x there in the derivative. And my b is going to be my 5, and my a is going to be my 1. Those are just your endpoints. And let's see, we'll clean those up a touch here. Um, 5 over c squared equals, I had f of 5 to be a 2, and f of 1 was a negative 2, and so that just turned out to be a 1 across multiply, and I got 5 equals c squared. So I'm thinking that c equals plus or minus radical 5. The problem is I have to reject negative radical 5 because it doesn't fall within the interval 1 to 5. So really my only solution is positive radical 5, which is about 2 point something. So you'll notice, um, so my, my, my dot here was fairly close. I might want to move it over a smidge so that it lines up with 2 point something. But radical 5 represents the point of tangent where the tangent line's parallel to the secant line. All right, a couple more examples here. On number one, I want to uh, we can easily identify the derivative as being negative 2x plus 8. Evaluate that at c. So I've got negative 2c plus 8 is equal to the average rate of change from 3 to 6. So I've got f of 6, that's my b value, and then 3 will be my a value. And we just got a little bit of number crunching here. I've got f of 6 um, to be negative 5, so I hope I did that right, or you can laugh at me tomorrow, and then f of 3 was a negative 2, and so that gave me negative 3 divided by 3, which is negative 1, so I'm going to subtract the 8 over, and then divide by negative 2, so I got c equals 9 halves, which is about, you know, it's, yeah, not even just about, that's exactly 4.5. So if I try to draw my, my tangent lines here, I'm picturing, um, you know, first of all, a secant line that goes from 3 down here to 6. So, you know, instantly I see that my t secant line has a very negative slope. And then I'm visualizing 4.5 you know, right around there. And that tangent line definitely looks like it's parallel. So I think I've got the right answer. You know, it certainly falls with my, in my interval. That's a good sign. You know, if you've got something that fell outside of the interval 3 to 6, that's a bad, that's probably a bad sign. You know what I'm saying? All right, now number two, just to speed things up, all I want to know is how many solutions there are to the mean value theorem. And I want to change the interval so that it goes from one to five. And so what I want you to be able to do here is I want you to be able to visualize a secant line that goes from, from x equals one all the way to x equals five. And then tell me how many parallel tangent lines are there to that point within the interval, of course. It looks like there's going to be one, you know, approximately right there, and there's going to be a second one right there. So we could set it up algebraically and attack that one, but just to save some time, uh, I just want to visually show you that there would be two solutions, not just one, if the interval is from one to five. Now, one of the things that I've kind of been glossing over are those two big prerequisites. And the big prerequisites that we must, you know, we have to be careful to make sure that F abides by is it has to be continuous on the closed interval from A to B, and it has to be differentiable on the open interval from A to B. And if that's not true, then the mean value theorem doesn't apply, and then just throw it right out the window. But, uh, you know, all the examples we saw up to this point were very well-behaved functions and certainly abided by those two prerequisites. Um, now, this one says, if I considered the interval from 0 to 5, would the mean value theorem apply for this nice, beautiful function g of x? 
And I would say, no way, Jose. The problem is, G has a vertical asymptote at x equals 3. Just by looking at the denominator, we can quickly identify that. And because 3 falls within the interval between 0 and 5, G is not continuous throughout the interval and the mean value theorem goes out the window and there's no guarantee that there does exist a parallel tangent line. However, if we do shift the interval over here to be 4 to 6, now within that interval G is continuous throughout the entire interval. The, uh, the vertical asymptotes now is on the outside. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and this is a great time for you to hit that pause button. We're not going to do 0 to 5, but we are going to do 4 to 6. I want you to try the mean value theorem all by yourself here and see if you can come up with the magical C value uh, that is guaranteed by the mean value theorem. So the first thing that I did is I just worked out uh, with the quotient rule. I tried to find the derivative of G. And uh, by the time I start cleaning it up, it looks like uh, I think those x's are going to cancel and we're going to end up with 1 over x minus 3 quantity squared and that's in terms of x. So the first thing my mean value theorem says is it says evaluate the derivative at c. So we've got 1 over c minus 3 quantity squared and I'm going to set that equal to g of 6 minus g of 4 divided by 6 minus 4. When I evaluated g of 6 I ended up with 2 thirds. g of 4 was a 0 and 2 thirds divided by 2 turns out to be 1 third. So I've got 1 over c minus 3 quantity squared equals 1 third. Cross multiply and take the square root of both sides. So I got radical 3. I'm not really worried about the negative version of radical 3 because that wouldn't give me a chance of getting back inside my interval there. So c equals 3 plus radical 3, which is uh, certainly bigger than 4 but smaller than 6. So that does fit nicely within the interval. So whatever that point happens to be, I can promise there will be a tangent line that is parallel to this guy's secant line. You know, we talked about, um, you know, not just finding right answers, but finding the most efficient path to that right answer. And a lot of times that's going to be the difference between, you know, a 3 or a 4 and, and hopefully the 5 that we're going to get on that AP exam that we're gunning for. And this is just a tremendous example. You know, if we're not thinking about, you know, the prerequisites, if we don't have the habit of asking ourselves, you know, number one, is my function continuous throughout the closed interval A to B? And number two, is my function differentiable throughout the open interval A to B? If I don't have that habit ingrained, I might you know, blindly jump into this problem right here and waste an enormous amount of time when this problem really should take about three seconds because I want you to be able to visualize cosecant. And cosecant, of course, is the reciprocal of the sine graph. I'm trying to graph one over the sine of x. And the way that I do that, and it's certainly, I don't, do a good job of memorizing cosecant, what I do is I visualize the sine curve. Every time the sine curve has a root, that implies that cosecant has a vertical asymptote, right? So we've got asymptotes at, uh, you know, negative 2 pi and negative pi and right there at 0 and then positive pi and positive 2 pi. And then the curve, you know, basically it it's got a min right there at 1, and then it's got a max right there at negative 1, and so forth and so forth. Well, hopefully you see a big problem with this rascal. You notice because of where my asymptotes are, I've got an asymptote right at x equals 0. And the problem is 0 falls in the middle of that interval. And uh, so right off the bat, we would say that the mean value theorem does not apply because of the fact that we were not continuous throughout the interval. Now, if they want to do the mean value theorem from like, you know, pi over 3 to pi over 6, then by all means, eat your heart out. You could go do that because the function is continuous from, you know, here to here, uh, but certainly not uh, on that interval. All right, now for our second mini lesson tonight, let me introduce you to a good friend of mine called Roll, a very famous mathematician, and he came up with this kind of a, a specific version of the mean value theorem, and he called it Roll's theorem, and he's been famous ever since. But what I want you to really understand, and, and, and hopefully you can appreciate this after this, the Roll's theorem is simply the mean value theorem in a specific instance, or one specific case of the mean value theorem. So he has, uh, it has to satisfy three, the following three hypotheses or prerequisites is a word I like to use. You know, number one, it's got to be continuous on the closed interval. We already hit that. F's got to be differentiable in the open interval. All right, we already hit that. But here's the kicker. There's a third prerequisite, and we're basically saying that F of A has to equal F of B, and then something special is going to happen. What you'll notice here on these four pictures 
is that if f of a and f of b are equal to each other, then you know we've got the same height. And what we're going to say is there has to be, well, what do you notice about the secant line that connects a and b? Every single secant line that connects a to b is horizontal, aren't they? So let's make that note. We do have horizontal secant lines. And that's true because f of a is guaranteed to equal f of b. And if we're going to be parallel to a horizontal secant line, that means we've created a horizontal tangent line. So basically, all Rolle's theorem does is it guarantees the existence of a horizontal tangent line, just as uh, this picture here dis uh, displays. And one comment here I want to make down here, or rather question it, does Rolle's theorem prove the existence of a relative max and min, or just prove the existence of a horizontal tangent line? And the answer to that question is it does prove the existence of a horizontal tangent line, which you know ninety you know nine percent of the time will end up being a max or min, but there's no guarantee that it will end up being a max or min. We just have the guarantee that there is a horizontal tangent line. If you're trying to think of an example that would prove you know my point right here, just go back and look at that very first picture we had. Um, you know, here's two endpoints, they're equal to each other. Is there a max or a relative max or min in that interval? No, there's not. So it just proves that there does exist at least one horizontal tangent line, doesn't prove there's a max or min. So here's two counterexamples just to prove how important those prerequisites are. Um, number one here, uh, we've got a discontinuous function. Um, in fact, it's continuous right up until the endpoint. This one would be continuous on the open interval A to B, but we didn't say that. We said it's got to be continuous on the closed interval. And so all of a sudden at B, things fell apart. And uh, so if you connected, we do have F of A equals F of B, but there's no horizontal tangent line within that interval. So that's an example where Rolle's theorem would not apply. And then the you know, and then we've got a continuous function, but this one's non-differentiable. There exists no tangent line right there, so. We do have a, a horizontal secant line, but we never had a horizontal tangent line. So here's the bottom line. You know, uh, the mean value theorem said f prime of c has got to equal f of b minus f of a. And we've got that down pat. We've done a lot of examples. And what you'll notice is that if f of b and f of a are the same, then by the time you subtract them, you get 0. And 0 divided by anything is 0. So Rolle's theorem proves that f prime of c has to equal 0. That's what the bottom line is. So let's take a look at an example here. Um, we can quickly confirm that uh, you know the secant line from negative three to negative one is zero. Uh, you know algebraically, if the graph wasn't sitting in under our nose right now, we would have to prove just by simple plugging in that f of negative three equaled f of negative one. And once you establish that, you can take your derivative, evaluate it at c, and simply set it equal to zero and you'll get c equals negative 2, which is certainly confirmed here visually that the you know that there's a horizontal tangent line that's parallel to our horizontal secant line. Again, just continue to be on your toes and check those prerequisites. Is this particular function continuous um, on the closed interval and differentiable on the open interval? Uh, it does look like this one has a vertical asymptote at x equals 6. Is that a bad thing? Is that a deal breaker? We've got a vertical asymptote at x equals 6. I think it's okay because the 6 doesn't fall within the interval. It falls just on the outside of it. So we're good to go. We can rock and roll. Uh, let's go ahead and confirm or at least ask ourselves, you know, is f of 5 equal to f of negative 3? In other words, is, is this Rolle's theorem or is it just a generic form of the mean value theorem? Well, in fact, as I plugged them in, I got f of 5 to be 0, and I got f of negative 3 to be 0. So not only are they the same, but they're 0 themselves. So we know that the derivative evaluated as c has got to equal 0. So we could simply run through some quotient rule to find our f prime, and then just set that quotient rule equal to 0, and we'd be off and running. So Rolle's theorem is really nothing different than a lot of the things we've done, been doing. Uh, so we're going to really focus on the mean value theorem tomorrow, and just appreciating it both graphically and algebraically. So... Hope you uh, felt comfortable tonight, and we'll rock and roll tomorrow, so we'll see you.